2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, the Bible reads, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except they come a fallen away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The title for the sermon this afternoon is The Pre-Tribulation Rapture Deception. The Pre-Tribulation Rapture Deception. What did it say there? Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. Listen, when it comes to the day of Christ, when it comes to the gathering of believers unto Christ, that day will not come except some things come first, as we saw there in that verse, okay? Now, I've got this book here. Uh, This is a book called Things to Come. It's a little bit worn out now. Uh, Things to Come by J. Dwight Pentecost, okay? Now, this this textbook um, is one of the biggest sellers Um, when it comes to end times teaching, when it comes to eschatology. This book is found in many Bible colleges throughout the world. I mean, I can't remember how many millions of copies have been sold. I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's it's a very, very popular book uh, written by J. Dwight Pentecost. Now, the little that I know of this man, he seems like a pretty decent guy. I mean, I, I I don't have anything against him, but I do have many things against this book, okay? Things to come. And uh, this is the book that's also used by the primary independent Baptist church uh, college, Bible college, I should say, in the primary independent fundamental Baptist college in Australia. And they'll use this book in the lectures. They'll use this book in the class. So if you went to do a a course on eschatology, they will get you to purchase this book and you will go through, your your requirement would be to read every page in this book. And I've read every page in this book, okay? I I definitely have. And I think I may have even read it twice. I I can't, or at least, at least, Definitely once and and a decent portion a second time. And so I'm going to be preaching against the pre-tribulation rapture, okay? Now, what I left off, this is our our series on the end times. We started this series on Wednesday. And I left off with the uh, uh, pre-millennial position that we hold. And I had mentioned there are two schools of thought when it comes to the pre-millennial position. That is that Christ will return, then he will establish his millennial kingdom. A thousand years where he will rule on this earth. And there are two thoughts behind it. Number one is a dispensational premillennial position, which this book holds to, and what most Baptist churches hold to, okay? And that is a position that's become famous in the last hundred years, all right? Now, dispensationalism is a requirement, 100% requirement, in order for you to conclude in the Bible, well, actually not in the Bible, but that's your conclusion, that there's a pre-tribulation rapture, that when Christ comes back, to give us resurrected bodies when he comes back in the clouds that he's going to do that before the tribulation to come. Now, this church, I, as your pastor, hold to a historic premillennial position. That is the position that Christ will come after the tribulation, that Christ will come after the man of sin is revealed. He'll come after the Antichrist uh, establishes himself and persecutes the believers. And the reason I brought this book here is I've had many discussions, some heated, but most of them very pleasant, very fruitful discussions. And I've gone through the reasons certain people believe in a pre-trib rapture. And quite often when I debunk those positions, they'll say to me, well, that's, uh, yeah, okay, I see what you're saying, but that's not why I believe it. And then I'll debunk another position. What? Yeah, I, I see where you're coming from, but that's not why I believe it. And so here's the thing. I mean, it's like any, if you, I talk to anybody, they've got all these different reasons why they believe in a pre-trib rapture. But you can't really nail them down. You can't really show, what's that verse that you, you believe again? What's that verse that you read that, that shows, that tells us that Christ is coming before the tribulation? No one can point to you to that, okay? And so what I decided to do, instead of, you know, giving reasons that I'm familiar with, I thought, let's go to the textbook. Let's go with the main, one of the main books the Bible colleges uses, and let's see what this author has to say. Because this is what many people are parroting. This is what many people are saying. I mean, you'll, even you'll be familiar with many of the things that are said in this book and so um, I'm not going to get through, I think there's like 20-something pages on the pre-trib rapture here. I'm not going to get through every argument this sermon. I hope to get through maybe half of them in this sermon, and then the other half, Lord willing, on Wednesday. That, that would be my plan. But the pre-tribulation rapture deception. Now look at 2 Thessalonians 2, chapter 3 again. What did it say there? For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. So there's going to be a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Very clear, very clear here. There are two things that must take place before the Lord returns. The man of sin is revealed and the fallen away, okay? Now, the pre-trib position will take 
and say, well, no, the rapture happens before the man of sin is revealed. And that man of sin is what we know as the Antichrist or the beast of the book of Revelation. So what I'm going to do, uh, this sermon is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to read portions. I've highlighted certain portions. I'm going to read portions to you as to why they believe what they believe. And then I'll give you the reason, what, what the Bible says. Okay? So we'll do it that way. Now, when it comes to the pre-tribulation rapture, it says here, there are basically two key thoughts here that the author lists why they believe, why, why he teaches or believes the pre-trib rapture. Number one, it says, number one, the essential basis of the pre-tribulation rapture position. Okay? So this is the essential basis. This is why he says we believe in the pre-trib rapture. This is what he says. Pre-tribulation rapturism rests essentially on one major premise. Oh man, what's the one major premise? The literal method of inter- in- interpretation of the scriptures. That's what that's what that's the one basis, brethren. The literal method of interpretation of the scriptures. Now, brethren, as your pastor, should you read this literally? Absolutely. Amen. Except when it's not. <laughs> okay? Except when it's it's obviously not to be taken literally. Okay? So me, I I totally believe that. I totally believe you should approach the Bible literally. That's what they're saying is the one thing. But here's the thing. Why don't I believe in the preacher rapture? Well, let's have a look. They've got a second reason here. The second major thing here, and this is where most of the points are made, the essential arguments of the pre-tribulation rapturists. I want you to think about it for a moment. The essential arguments of the pre-tribulation rapturists. If I was defending a position, brethren, if I came to you teaching something, would I come with you with essential arguments? Or would I just open up the Bible and show you some verses? Isn't that how we build doctrine on the Word of God? Or do we build doctrine from arguments? Appealing to logic. Appealing to who can win an argument. That's not how you build doctrine. <laughs> you build it on the Word of God. But here's the thing. Okay, now there are like 20-something reasons. I'm going to try to get through 10 or 11 of them uh, this afternoon. So let me go through their essential arguments for the pre trib rapture. Okay, argument number one, which is kind of what we already read. Number one, the literal method of interpretation. Again, they harp on that they're, they're readers that take the Bible literally, right? They, what they read, they believe. They take it literally. Great. I like that attitude. It says here, the literal method of interpretation. It is frankly and freely admitted by our millennials. Now, I talked a little bit about our millennials on Wednesday. Who are they? They're the people that don't really believe in a uh, literal millennial on this earth, right? And that Christ will come once we evangelize this entire world, once we become a Christian world, they believe that's when Christ is coming back. So what they're saying is, our millennials will frankly admit that the basic issue in the controversy between pre and themselves is the issue of the method of interpretation to be employed in the interpretation of prophecy. So why are we pre I agree with the author. You know, we take the Bible literally. That thousand years that I went through with you in the book of Revelation, we believe that's a literal thousand years, not some spiritual thing or, you know, longer than a thousand years. No, it's, it's definitely a thousand years. But what this author continues to do is then say, in order for you to remain consistent with a literal position, you will end up believing the pre-trib rapture. No verses provided. No verses. Listen, that's the section. The section is is one page long, okay? The section is one page long, no verses. They just said they believe in the literal interpretation of Scripture, not a single literal verse given. Could you imagine that? <laughs> if I, said, I mean, what in the world? You know, now, no literal verses. I mean, what they should now do, we believe it literally, so here are some verses, right? Here are the two and three witnesses of the literal reading that the rapture is happening before the tribulation. Not one given. But here's what they fooled the reader into thinking, right? The, the, the reader who's easily manipulated, the reader that's easily deceived, they're going to conclude, oh, the preacher rapture, that must be a literal position. Okay? Now, keep that in mind. They've said that twice already, okay? Now, the second point they make here is the nature of the 70th week. This is the, the next reason. There are a number of words used in both the Old and New Testaments, so I'm reading the book here, to describe the 70th week period. So we believe in this 70th week period, this 70 weeks of prophecy from, the, from Daniel, and we do believe there's one week left. And that week doesn't represent seven days, it represents seven years. So just so you know what's going on here. And then it says, there are many words used to describe it, and these are some words used to describe the seven-year period. Wrath, judgment, 
indignation, punishment, uh, destruction, darkness. So far, I agree on all of this. All of these words are used to describe some portion, some part of that seven-year period, right? But then the author says this, it must be noted that these references describe the period in its entirety, not just a portion of it, so that the whole period bears this characterization. Okay, do you see what he's saying? Now listen, I'm, I'm going to go into this later on, but I believe in a period called the beginning of sorrows, which leads up to the midst of the week, Jesus describes. At the midst of the week, he then calls out the great tribulation. Okay, then after, and we'll probably go look at that later on. After that, when the, when the sun is dark and the moon turns to blood and the stars from, from heaven, that's called the wrath of God. Okay, the day of God's wrath. Okay, but what, and, and so I, I don't have a problem with these words, wrath, judgment, destruction. Another one they've got here is the hour of temptation. They'll say, and what they're trying to say is, all of these words describe the, the entire seven-year period. Chapter and verse. Can you show me a chapter, a verse, a book of the Bible that says the entire seven-year period is described by all these elements? No. Okay? Now, they started with truth. They, this, this, they started with it, 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 it uh, includes all these things. But then he wants you to think the entire period can be called all that. Now, that's just his opinion. That's not a Bible verse. That's not an argument for the pre-trib rapture, is it? And here's the thing. He's got two areas here that we're going to look at. And if you guys can go to Revelation 3, please. Go to Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 10. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Because this is what he wants you to believe is the seven-year period and why they believe in a pre-trib rapture. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. The Bible reads, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world and try them that dwell upon the earth. There it is, brethren. There's the pre-trib rapture. Say, where? There right there. Didn't you, didn't you read it? From the hour of temptation. You say, hold on, hold on. So they just finished saying they believe in a literal reading. So if we, okay, that's what they told us. I'm going to believe them. I'm not going to rebel against you. I'm going to believe exactly what you said. Okay, literal reading. I will keep thee from the hour. But you want me to believe that's seven years? Wait a minute. Who's been literal and who's been figurative? Is an hour seven years? Man, you know, this service will be over in an hour. Did you re were you really sitting here for seven years long? No. Listen, the literal reading is the hour. And then what is it? The hour of temptation. Is this the great tribulation? Is this a seven-year period? No, it's talking about temptation. If we want to take a literal view, this is an hour of temptation. They are not taking a literal view. They are taking a figurative view. They want you to believe hour equals seven years. That's not literal. They want you to believe temptation is the great tribulation. That's not literal. Guess what we found? The first, first point, the second point, contradiction. Contradiction in their arguments. All right? And look, I, I'm a faithful guy wanting to learn the Bible. I want to believe what they just said, that it's literal. I want to take a literal reading, but they've, they've deviated from it. They're saying we're consistently literal. Next point, they broke that. They broke their argument already. And brethren, this was my problem as a, as a young Christian. I believed the pre-trib rapture, and I kept seeing these contradictions. You're telling me it's literal, but you're not showing me any literal verses. In fact, you're taking portions and turning them into figurative speech and wanting me to interpret those passages with a figurative interpretation of the, of, of the rapture. No. You know, these, these arguments fall apart. What else do they mention here? They mention in Jeremiah 37, don't, you don't need to turn there, alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, and he shall be saved out of it. See, the seven-year tribulation, it's for Jacob. Well, hold on. Alas, for that day is great. What, so now you want me to not take this literally? You want me to now take this figurative? That a day equals seven years? Brethren, it's a failure. These arguments are not arguments. You know why? Because they're not built on any literal scriptures. They're not built on any verses of the Bible. And here's the thing. This is the, the thing. If you have a, a brother in the Lord that believes in a pre-trib rapture, all you need to ask them, show me one verse. And when they can't find the verse, just say, look, if you want to keep believing the pre-trib rapture, I'm fine with that, but I want you to at least admit that it's not in the Bible. I'm fine with you believing what you want. It doesn't hurt me. 
But I just want you to admit that it's not something that's built on the Word of God. It's not built in any literal reading, and your argument for the nature of the 17 week falls apart because you've now gone figurative in your language. Now think about this, brethren. If I said to you, you know, when we, when we read Genesis chapter 1, and, you know, we know that God created everything in six days. If I said to you, brethren, you know, I believe in the literal reading of the Bible. I believe in a literal creation there in Genesis 1. And then I get behind the pulpit and say, well, here's the thing. On day number one, you know, each of these six days, you know, each day represents a thousand years. That's what it represents, a thousand years. Am I being literal now? But what if I, no, no, I am being literal. Because my interpretation is built on, on the literary, uh, li- literacy. And you'll say, well, it says evening and morning were the first day. Well, yeah, so you've got to understand evening is the first 500 years and the morning is the next 500 years to make the 1,000 years, right? I mean, you would say, Pastor Kevin, you're being retarded, right? You'd say, you know, you've got a retarded doctrine there, Pastor Kevin, all right? But here's the thing. At least I could go to a verse, okay, now badly used, not in, out of context, and I can turn to 2 Peter 3.8, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now that's out of context. It's got nothing to do with creation, right? But here's the thing. At least I found a verse that has a day and a thousand years. Listen, that's more than what the pre-trib rapture believer has. Can you show me where one hour equals seven years anywhere in the Bible? Or one day equals seven years anywhere in the Bible? Man, if you think my interpretation of creation is ridiculous, what about the pre-trib rapture? It's a failure. It's not built on the Word of God. Not even close. You can't even take verses out of context and show seven years as as an hour or anything like that, okay? So that's the second point. The third point is this, the scope of the 70th week. The scope. What they say is, when this period is being anticipated in Daniel 9, God says, and you guys, go, go please go to Daniel, Daniel chapter 12. Go to Daniel chapter 12. When this period is being anticipated in Daniel 9, God says to the prophet, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city, in verse number 24. Now, you guys go to Daniel 12. So this, and, and that's true. That's what God says to Daniel. And then he says, this whole period has a special reference to Daniel's people, Israel, and Daniel's holy city, Jerusalem. Now, I do partly believe what is being taught here. Yes, God did say these words to Daniel, that this 70-week period is for Daniel's people and for Daniel's holy city. And I do believe that city is Jerusalem because Jerusalem does also play a major role in the end times, okay? But the author, without giving us a Bible verse, wants us to believe that Daniel's people is Israel. So all the Jews that make up the nation of Israel, that's Daniel's people, and according to the author. Now, you guys are in Daniel 12, verse 1. Daniel 12, verse 1. What does the Bible say? They've not given us a Bible verse to tell us that it's Israel. Okay, it could be, but we need a Bible verse to tell us what it is, right? Daniel 12, verse 1, the Bible reads, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. Hey, there's the people of Daniel. And there shall be a time of trouble, and this is the same as to the tribulation, such as never was since there was a nation, even to the same time. Look at this. And at that time thy people shall be delivered. Oh man, all the Israelites, all the Jews, all the non-believing Jews, because of their DNA, because of their blood, they're going to be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. That's Daniel's people. Everyone that is found written in God's book. And listen, if you're saved, you, regardless if, if you're Jew, Gentile, if you're saved, you believe on Christ, you are written in God's holy book. Okay? The Bible tells us in Revelation 5, uh, 3, 5, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Please go to Exodus 32. Exodus 32. Daniel's people are saved people. Okay, Daniel's people are saved people those that have their names written in the book of life. Exodus 32, please. Exodus 32, 32. Now, what we're about to read is after Moses goes up to Mount Sinai, remember he comes back and they, they built the golden calf and they're worshiping it, they're dancing naked and all this kind of stuff. 
right? And of course, a very wicked thing that they've done, and God wants to destroy the Israelites. But this is what uh, Moses says to God in Exodus 32, 32. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever have sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Here's what's beautiful about the Old Testament and the New Testament. We have the same book, okay, that has our names. And those that, are, you know, uh, don't believe on Christ, those that are unsaved, if they were to die or become reprobate, their names would be taken out of the book of life. But if you are saved, your name remains. This is consistent in the Old Testament. You can't tell me Daniel's got some other book. I mean, Moses is talking about the same book, okay, and making sure that he, he would rather have his name blotted out than all of the Israelites. I mean, he cares for the people, right? And of course, I'll just read another passage to you. Revelation 21, 27 says, And there shall in no wise enter into anything that defileth, neither whatsoever work of abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life, speaking of the new Jerusalem, right, the, the heavenly city, only those that are names written in the book of life, in the book of the uh, Lamb's book of life, can enter into that city. And guess what? That city has 12 gates. And those 12 gates are the tribes, the names of the tribes of Israel. Okay? Old Testament saints, New Testament saints, our names are written in the same book. And we are the people of Daniel. And Daniel is our people. He's our person. Okay? Because we're all saved in the same way by grace through faith. And so this author just, he doesn't want to show us a verse. He just says, oh, it's Israel. There's truth, right? And if you're not careful, you, you, you add, that's true, that's true. Daniel's people, Israel, I guess that's true. Daniel's, and you just keep going like that. No, you go and you build your doctrine, your beliefs on the Word of God. The Word of God is very clear. Who are Daniel's people? Those who are saved. Those that have their names written in the Lamb's book of, of life. All right. So um, the next argument they've got here for the pre-trib rapture, is the purpose of the 70th week. The purpose behind it. And it says here, the second, uh, if you guys, let me, what can you, I'll get you to turn to um, Mark 9. Go to Mark 9. The second major purpose of the 70th week, the, Bible, the book reads here, is in relation to Israel. You see, the 70th week, it's all about Israel, brethren. It's not about you, you, you Gentile Australian. Okay, it's about these physical Israelites and here's their argument for it. I'm glad I've at least taken the Bible now. <laughs> Malachi 4, 5, and 6. I'll just read Malachi 4, 5. This is their argument. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, that great and dreadful day of the Lord is a future event. Okay? And the, and the Bible saying that Elijah will come before that day. Okay? Has Elijah come, though, brethren? Did he come already? Well, look at uh, Mark chapter 9, please. Mark 9, 11. Mark 9, 11. And actually, before I read the, the, the passage, let me read to you in the book what their argument for this is. So they write here, It can only be concluded then that Elijah, who is, the, who is to come before the great and terrible day of the Lord, can have only one ministry, only one, that of preparing a remnant in Israel for the advent of the Lord. What in the world? <laughs> the author's telling me, Elijah's only got one ministry. Just, just one thing he wants to do, just to get Jews saved. He doesn't care about anybody else. Did you know that? He doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about your relatives that might go through the tribulation or whatever it is, okay? All he cares about is getting the Jews saved according to this book, all right? And, and so they say, because Elijah came, and, and oh, let's read the passage, Mark 9, 11. And they asked him, speaking to Jesus, what, why say the scribes that Elias must first come? That's Elijah. And he answered and told them. So Jesus gives the answer. Elias verily cometh first and restoreth all things. And how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be set at naught. But I say unto you that Elias is indeed come and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed as it is written of him. Now if you know the Bible, they're speaking of John the Baptist. Okay, when Jesus says that Elias has come, Elijah has come, he's referring to the same spirit by which John the Baptist came, okay? Now, John the Baptist came pointing us to Christ, okay? Now, <laughs> here's what's funny about that. So they're, they're thinking that Elijah has a, I mean, that's the fulfillment there of, of Malachi 4, 4, 5. 
That's the fulfillment. John the Baptist. This is already taking place. All right? But what they're trying to say is, well, Elijah has to come again, and because his main ministry was in Judea, well, his main ministry will be in that place again, and he's only trying to reach the Jews. Say, well, where's that argument come from? If you guys can go to Revelation 11, please. Go to Revelation chapter 11. And the argument this person is making here is, well, it said he's coming before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Well, he's already come before the dreadful, great and dreadful day of the Lord, hasn't he? I mean, that's still to come. And Elijah came 2,000 years ago before Christ. Okay, so it's already, I mean, that, as far as that, if you want to just take a very literal view of that scripture, it's already been fulfilled. Okay, but they want you to believe that Elijah's going to come again or John the Baptist is going to come again. One of these guys is going to come again, right, just to preach the Jews. All right. Now, they get this from Revelation chapter 11. Look at this. Revelation chapter 11, verse 3, because this is about the two witnesses. It says here, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Now, that thousand uh, 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 1,203 score days represents three and a half years, okay? Many people, as do I, believe this is Elijah and Moses. And so is Elijah coming back in the future? He is. Well, if that's Elijah. But here's the thing. Does the Bible tell us it's Elijah? Does it tell us it's Moses? The Bible doesn't say these things. Now, you can have a very strong opinion that it is them. I have a very strong opinion that it's them. I can make an argument for them. But can I really be that dogmatic and say it's definitely them when the Bible doesn't actually tell us it's those two? You can't be. Okay? So is this, is this scripture that they're talking about, that Elijah's just going to come for the Jews, is that really being taught literally from the Bible? These are just opinions. These are just arguments. Now, it may very well be Elijah. Now, if he's coming for three and a half years, I want you to consider this. And obviously, I've not covered, um, obviously, this is a series, so I haven't covered it yet in the series. But we believe in a post-trip pre-raph rapture. And at the midst of the week, there's a, a, a great tribulation of the Antichrist persecuting the people of God, the children of God, believers, the church, okay? Shortly after that three and a half year period, that's when the Lord's going to come back and rapture his believers. But here's the thing, that's, that's shortly after the three and a half years. Now, these two witnesses, they're going to be there for three and a half years, okay? So that's going to be the second half of the three and a half years. That means if you scale it back, these two witnesses appear shortly before the rapture, shortly before the day of the Lord, okay? Think about that. So shortly before, that means if we're here on the last days, facing the tribulation, we are going to find, we're going to see these two witnesses, you know, probably Elijah and Moses, you know, preaching. And guess, and we're there. We're going to be there, okay? So it's not that they just have a ministry just for Jews, because believers from all across the world are going to be there at the same time, okay? If we just take it literally, which they want me to take literally in the Bible, okay? I mean, an argument for this, that, you know, it's only for the Jews, it fails. I mean, there's no verse that actually says anything like that. They've got to stretch a prophecy from Malachi, which Jesus says was fulfilled in John the Baptist. Okay. Now, let's keep going. The next point they've got here is the unity of the 70th week. Now, brethren, if I haven't explained something clearly to you, just please, you can ask me any questions after the service, any questions after the sermon, any questions during the week about what I'm preaching. I'm I'm more than happy to try to clarify if I'm trying to, if I'm rushing through these things. But the next point is the unity of the 70th week, all right? <laughs> um, please go to Matthew 24. Please go to Matthew 24. And while you're turning there, I'll read to you from this book. It says here, While all would agree on the basis that Daniel 9.27, so that's one portion of Scripture, Matthew 24.15, that's another portion, and Revelation chapter 13... That's three, there's three witnesses, great. We all would agree, yeah, that the week, that seven-year period, is divided into two parts of three and one-half years each. We would agree with that, right? Amen? And then it says here, yet the nature and character of the week is one, permeating both parts in their entirety. Think about that. Even though we have three major passages of the Bible, making a clear distinction between the first three and a half years and the next three and a half years, just believe the author that it's all the same one thing. Who cares? It, it, it's, it, there's a unity in the 70th week. Do you think God would tell us three times about a division, about the middle of the week, if it's just it's all the same thing? But that's what he wants us to believe. You say, why? Because the pre-rapture, pre-rapture believers, pre-tribulation rapture believers, 
cannot distinguish the differences between the wrath of God and the tribulation. They don't want you to distinguish the differences. So it's all the same one thing. It's all, uni- it's all the unity of the seventh day of the week. Who cares about this divided period in the middle? It's not that important, even though Jesus tells us, or the Bible tells us three different times. Listen, brethren, if, if, if God is telling us three different times about this division of three and a half years each, that means it's important. That means there's a division. We're talking about rightly dividing the Word of God. God divides it for us. So we go off the division that God has given us between these periods. Now, let me show you the division very quickly. Matthew 24, 7. I, re- I kind of mentioned it very quickly to you before, but just quickly here. Verse number 7. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. This beginning of sorrows leads up to the first half of that seven-year period, that first three and a half years, to the midst of the week. Look at verse number 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. I'll just read to you very quickly from Daniel 9.27, the midst of the week. This abomination of desolation takes place in the midst of the week. Why is that important? Because, like this author said, Daniel 9.27, Matthew 24.15, Revelation 3, there's a division, there's something that happens in the middle of that week, and it's when the Antichrist reveals himself. It's when he's exalted himself and he demands the people of the world to worship him and to worship the dragon. And this period now is now known in the Bible as the Great Tribulation. Okay? Now, look at verse number 29. Verse number 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, so we have the tribulation, now there's a period after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give it light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Now, this corresponds neatly with Revelation 6.13, which says, And the stars of heaven fell onto the earth, even as a fig tree cast of her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. For the great, And then verse number 17 says, For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? So what's the Bible teaching us? Why is that division important? The three and a half years and the three and a half years. Beginning of sorrows. The entire world will be in distress during those first three and a half years. In the midst of the week, the Antichrist will exalt himself, demand worship, demand that you worship the dragon, the mark of the beast, all those kinds of things. That is known as the Great Tribulation. Those that do not take the mark, he will persecute. He will persecute the believers that do not want to, are not going to worship the dragon, right? Then immediately after the Tribulation, shortly after that three and a half year period, that's when Christ returns and then the people of the earth are wailing because of it and they're saying that the great day of his wrath is come. Beginning of sorrows, half point, great tribulation, then um, God's wrath, God's wrath upon this earth. And we believe in a post-tribulation after the persecution of the Antichrist, but before God pours out his wrath, that we will be raptured from the earth. So this author saying, look, just, just ignore the division. It's all the same. No, there are clear distinctions. Okay, The literal reader of the Bible will see those distinctions and notice these are important things. Who's trying to deceive, brethren? Sounds like this author is trying to deceive. Sounds like he's trying to tell you it's all one and the same thing. And he, this is why. Because we know that as believers, we will not face the wrath of God. And he wants you to believe the entire thing is the wrath of God. And so he writes this. He writes, the latter group, referring to the church, will go... Sorry. Oh, sorry, the latter group here talking about Israel in his sense. Will go into the tribulation period. For Revelation 2.22 indicates clearly that the unsaved prof- professing church will experience this visitation of wrath. Please go to Revelation 2.22. Let's see what this author is talking about. Revelation 2.22. Revelation, actually, sorry, I missed the point. So this is the next point he makes. The nature of the church. The nature of the church, okay? So let's talk about the nature. You guys are going to Revelation 2.22. Look at this. It says here, because, you know, he doesn't want any church, any safe people to be part of the tribulation, right? So when he's faced with a passage here in Revelation 2.22, what does it say? Behold, I will cast her, and this is talking about the um, church in Thyatira, behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Now listen, I'm a reader, a literal reader of the Bible. This is talking about a church, and if they're not careful, if they don't repent, The Bible says here they're going to go into great tribulation. Isn't that what it says, literally? Of course that's what it says, right? But do they want 
churches to be in that period of time? No, they don't want. So what are they going to do with a passage like that? Well, this is what he says. Revelation 2.22, so what we just read about these people, indicates clearly that the unsaved professing church will experience this visitation of wrath. What's he saying? These people are not saved. That's why they're going to face the great tribulation. Because obviously, in, the, in his view, the saved will be raptured and go to heaven. Okay, well, am I going to believe Dr., you know, what's his name? Dwight Pentecost? Or am I going to try to get some, something solid from the Bible? Are these people saved or unsaved? Well, first of all, because it's a church, you should automatically think they're saved. Yeah, but that's not good enough, right? We need, we need a scripture. Let's go back two verses. Just two verses, J. Dwight Pentecost, that you forgot to read. All right, verse number 20, Revelation 2, verse 20. It says here, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, look at this, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Who's, who, who are these people that are committing fornication with Jezebel? The servants of God, the servants of Christ. These are believers. All right? These are believers that have been deceived by this woman preacher. And then you're telling me that it's, they're unsaved? Listen, the Bible's clear. These people are saved, and even the saved can fall into some major heresies or some major sins. And that's the warning here. If, if a church were to fall into those things, they need to repent of those things. Or don't expect protection during the Great Tribulation. You'll be cast into that Great Tribulation and just suffer and die, basically. All right? So, I mean, he's telling you they're unsaved, but Jesus tells me they're his servants. I'm going to go with Jesus on this one, not with Dr. Pentecost. Okay? Let's keep going. The next argument he makes. The concept of the church as a mystery. The concept of the church as a, mis a mystery. It says here, uh, in his writings, the church is manifestly an... In in listen, listen to this. Think of New Life Baptist Church. Think about other good churches that are serving the Lord, that are the church of Christ. This is how he wants you to think about the church. The church is manifestly an interruption. Brethren, you're just an interruption. What are you doing here? Can you let God go about his business dealing with the Jews, please? Can you stop interrupting God's program? All right? <laughs> the church is manifestly an interruption of God's program for Israel, which was not brought into being until Israel's rejection of the offer of the kingdom. It must logically follow that the mystery program must itself be brought to a conclusion before God can resume his dealing with the nation Israel. It must logically follow. What's he arguing from? Man's logic. Chapter and verse, please. Can I see where, where the church is the interruption of God's plan? Can you show me where God put Israel aside just to deal with some Gentile believing interruptions? Okay, now he wants an interruption gone so he can finally go back to plan A. Can you give me a verse about that? It's just logic. It angers me, brethren, because Jesus died for the church. He purchased it with his own blood. And you want to call that an interruption? Man, this is the most beautiful thing that Christ has ever done for us. I would never use those words describing it. Now, I'm just going to read a portion of Scripture to you. I want to speed up here. Are the Gentiles an interruption? Is the New Testament church an interruption? Matthew 8, 10. And Jesus heard it and marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. He's speaking about a Roman centurion, a non-Jew who had great faith. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Does, oh man, these are the interruptions. No, Jesus says they're welcome from the east and the west. They're going to sit down with these patriarchs. Okay, they're going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, ja Jacob's Israel. Okay, he's going to, we're going to sit down. And then he says this, but the children of the kingdom, those are the Jews, shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Listen, Israel that rejected Christ, that have a false religion in Judaism, okay, they're not part of God's program in the future. They're going to be cast into outer darkness. It's, God's not dealing with some interruption. It's all plan A. Us together, Jews, Gentiles, sitting down together. You know, fellowshipping together in that one body. Jesus says in John 10, 16, 
and other sheep have I, which, which are not of this fold. They're not of Israel, not of this fold. Them also must I bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Beautiful words from Jesus Christ. We're all one. Stop being a racist. You know, pre-trib rapture believers, the Jews aren't special. They're just the same as you and I. They need Jesus. They need to be saved. Okay? They need to be saved, these people. The next thing they've got here, the next point, point number eight, is the distinction between Israel and the church. There's distinctions between Israel. What did I just read? What distinction? Anyway, these two groups cannot be united into one. I'm sorry, Jesus. You said you wanted one fold. Dr. Pentecost says you can't do it. Can't be done, Jesus. You got it all wrong. Brethren, listen, I'm not, am I going to finish this series on this? I don't know. Where are the verses? Where is the Bible verse telling me what, you, what you're telling me is true? From Where is it? Literal reading of the Bible? Nonsense. Rubbish. Give me the Bible. Give me Bible verses. You can give me Bible verses for the virgin birth. You can give me Bible verses for the second coming of Christ. You can give me Bible verses for the atonement uh, of Christ, His sacrifice, His shed blood, salvation by grace through faith. Where's the Bible verse for the pre trib rapture? Oh, we're just going to make arguments for it. Logic. You know? What Jesus says He wants to do can't be done. Could you imagine if, if I'm like this as a pastor and my sermons are all like this? I haven't given you many arguments for the why, why salvation is by grace through faith and not even give you a Bible verse. He's like, get, get out of there. You mean, there's like a hundred verses. Can't you turn to one? Right? And here's the thing. And listen, I love my brothers because they've been deceived. What did we see about the end times? Deception. They've been deceived. The last hundred years, they've been deceived. Okay? And I want them to listen to this sermon. And I don't want them to think, man, Pastor Kevin's angry at me. Listen, you're deceived. I feel sorry for you. You need to believe the Bible. You need to go back and believe the Word of God. Your pastor tells you you've got to believe the Bible. Okay? But right now, you're believing your pastors. You're believing your Bible college lectures. You're believing J. Dwight Pentecost. Where's the verse? Where's one verse? Give me one. At least I've got the thousand years in the one day for the 6,000 years of creation, right? <laughs> you had a context one. Give me something. Can't be done. Give me something. Anyway, what was I? Sorry, what was I up to? Um, the nature of the church. No, no, sorry, not that one. The distinction. So these troops, uh, two groups cannot be united into one. Uh, and then they say this. The extent of the Bible revelation. So this is why they can't be united into one. The extent of the, of the biblical revelation. See, for Israel, the Bible, so this is a pretty big book, right? For Israel, nearly four-fifths of the Bible, and for the church, about one-fifth. Man, you're like, I, I'm, I'm struggling to read the Bible cover to cover. Well, I'm, I'm glad to tell you, you don't need to read one-fifth of it, bro. <laughs> now you've read it cover to cover, because that's only for you for the church. What nonsense. You know what? Nonsense, right? <laughs> um, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, fully furnished unto all good works. All of it, okay? All of it's for us, not just one-fifth. Second point, the divine purpose. Israel, the, listen, listen to this. How, her, how heretical is this? Now, I don't know if he means it, but it sounds heretical. The divine purpose between Israel and the church. Israel, the earthly promises of the covenants, so that's for them, and the church, the heavenly promises in the gospel. Huh? The gospel is not for the Jews? The gospel is not for Israel? <laughs> Romans 1.16 For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Listen, the gospel is for the Jews. Okay, for the Greek, for the Gentiles, for everybody. What do you mean? You are creating this, this J. Dwight Pentecost creating distinctions? You're, cre you're telling us something. You're, you're telling me Jesus can't do, Jesus cannot save the Jews and the Gentiles by the same gospel. Now, I don't know if he means that, but that's what it sounds like. Number three, the seed of Abraham, Israel, the physical seed, of whom some become a spiritual seed, church, 
a spiritual seed. Is that right? The seed of Abraham. Is the seed of Abraham Israel physically and the church spiritually? Kind of some truth to that a little bit. But is that really is that really the point that the Bible makes when it comes to a literal reading of the Bible? No, it says Galatians 3.16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the, pro- were the promises made. He saith not to seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed, which is Jesus Christ. Oh, which is Christ. That's the seed. Did you miss Galatians 3, which just tells us plain, literally, what the seed is? It's Jesus. It's not the physical nation of Israel. It's not the church, whatever version of church they've got here. The seed is Jesus. All right. And then if we're in Jesus Christ, in verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Does it sound like there's a physical and there's a spiritual seed? No. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Okay? We're all one. A seed because of Christ. Okay? Skips over that. Skips over that. And I, okay, I'm not going to keep reading this. Uh, I've got, I got a lot to cover. Let's move on. The next one. The doctrine of imminence. This is another reason they believe in the pre-trib rapture. The doctrine of imminence. What's imminence? Christ can come back at any moment is what they believe. Okay. So let's have a look. There's many verses here that he says teach about the imminence imminent return of Christ, Christ can come back at any moment. It says here, the church was told to live in the light of the imminent coming of the Lord to translate them in his presence. So apparently we're told to live in light of an imminent coming. Now I do believe, and I taught this, that we are told to live in light of his coming, but imminent coming at any moment, you know, could come back in two seconds, could come back after this sermon, could come before this, you know, before this day ends. Is that what the Bible teaches? And so they've got some verses here. Let's have a look at the first two because I don't have time to go through all of them. The first one for proof is John 14, verse 2. John 14, verse 2 and 3, which reads, In my Father's house, these are the words of Jesus, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Well, no, no. It's meant to say something about imminent coming. He's come back in any moment. Wasn't there. Oh, but you gave me a reference. Now, brethren, listen. The Bible college student reads this imminent coming of Christ. Oh, man, look at all these references. Christ is coming back at any moment. How many of them do you think will turn to those passages and read it and prove it? Was there an imminent coming in that passage? Was there a coming of Christ? Yes. Was there an imminent coming at any moment? No. It's a lie. It's deception. What's the next one they've got? Acts 1.11, which says, Which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. At any moment. Ah, oh, no, it's not there. You know, it, it could be before this day ends. No, it's not, it wasn't there. It's just saying Jesus Christ is coming back. Amen. Jesus Christ is coming back. But these verses don't speak anything about an imminent return. Listen, these are arguments for his position of a pre trib rapture. The verses he's using don't even teach what he's saying. I mean, that doesn't surprise us, right? <laughs> doesn't surprise us. But listen, this is a textbook. Do you think there'd be something decent in here about the pre-trib? And here's what's funny about that. You can look at it later. Pre-tribulation rapture theory. I think he knows. I think he knows, you know, <laughs> something's not quite right. <laughs> yeah, let's just call this a theory. All right, let's keep going. The work of the restrainer. Now, I'm, I'm going to hurry up. Let me just see what I'm up to. Oh, no, I'm almost done. All right, I'll finish up on this one. The work of the restrainer. Point number 10. The work of the restrainer. Can you please go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which is what we read? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. The work of the restrainer. Verse number 7. The Bible reads, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now let a full let until he be taken out of the way. So here, there's a, there's a he that needs to be taken out of the way. Okay, let's just keep that in mind. And then shall the wicked be revealed. And that wicked is the beast, is the Antichrist, yes. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Amen. Awesome. 
So uh, who is this person that needs to be taken out of the way? Well, I'm glad I've got this textbook to tell me. Okay, so the work of the restrainer in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He writes here, It would seem that the only one, and it's funny how he says it, it would seem that the only one who could do such a restraining ministry would be the Holy Spirit. As long as the Holy Spirit is resident within the church, which is his temple, anyway, this restraining work will continue and the man of sin cannot be revealed. It is only when the church, the temple is removed that this restraining ministry ceases and lawlessness, lawlessness can produce the lawless one or the wicked one, as we read there. Okay, So he's saying it would seem the one that's taken out of the way is the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm a literal reader of the Word of God. So we go to that passage, and you can read it in your own time, read it. Guess what? The Holy Spirit's not mentioned, mentioned in that passage at all. It's not mentioned. Okay, so then we're left with, well, what's it talking about, right? And then we talk about context. You know, have you, how many times have you heard preachers say, stay, keep to the context, go back to the context. Let's go to the context. Holy Spirit's not mentioned. Well, I guess you seemed wrong, brother. You know, J. Dwight Pentecost, it was wrong. You know, you're, you're, you know, and look, this, this man's passed, this man passed away, I think, uh, about five years ago. And he died at like 99. He's an old man, okay? Seems like a decent guy. I, again, I've not really studied his life. From what I read about the gospel, sounded okay to me. I didn't see any major issues with it. But I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying this guy's saved or not. I, don't, I really don't know, okay? I'm saying this is the book that was given to me for Bible college. Now, I didn't go to Bible college. I did a course through my local church. And we had to buy this book, but um, I was actually given a copy. Uh, my pastor's copy gave me, my pastor gave me his copy so I could read through it. And that's the first time I read through it. And I, so I have read it through twice. His, I read it through him. And then when I did the course in my church, I read through it again. And so, well, what's the context? What, what do we get out of this? Okay. Look at verse number six. Let's just go back one verse. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse six. And now we know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. Look, the the Apostle Paul is saying, and now ye know. He's just saying, look, I just finished telling you, now you know who's withholding the wicked one from being revealed. What a strange thing to say we know without, and then, oh, it must be the Holy Spirit when it's not even mentioned. It's got to come from the Word of God, right? It's got to come from the Word of God. And what I'm saying to you, brethren, this isn't difficult. The only one that's in that context is the Antichrist himself. It's the only one. Say, what does that mean? Well, the Antichrist, he's a normal man, okay? He's a normal man. He needs to be taken out of the way for the wicked ones to be revealed. So who's getting revealed? Him again. But now as a wicked one, now as a son of perdition, okay? Now, how do you know that? Well, this is why the Bible is so consistent. Please go to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. Revelation 17, verse 8. The beast, now again, the Bible uses the word beast many times in the book of Revelation to refer to the Antichrist. Same person. The beast that thou sawest was, so in the past, and is not. Now the Bible uses this term to about someone that's died. He's no longer there. He's not. And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. So he was and is not but is now ascending out of this pit, this is like a resurrection. This Antichrist is going to, ba- you know, is going to basically say he's Jesus Christ or some type of s- Messiah. Okay? He's going to go for something similar, right? And go into perdition. That's damnation. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, and they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. All right? He was, past. Not, and yet is. Why? Because he's alive again. He's gone through some type of death. Uh, he's lived, died, and come back to life. Okay? And the people wonder at the beast. All right? And now you can understand why they're going to worship him. Because he's setting himself up to be this God or this Jesus Christ. Now go to Revelation 13, please. Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. So who needs to be taken out of the way? Well, the one that was. Okay? And, which, and when the wicked is revealed, and yet is. It's the same guy. The same guy that gets taken out of the way will then be, we'll have a look at this. Revelation 13, verse 3. 
Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as it was wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. There it is. They're wondering after, right? That he's been healed from this. He's come back. Look at this. Verse number 4. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him, this is now that he's come back from that death, right? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months, the next three and a half years, he's given that power. Say, what's this about? Well, here's what's going to happen, brethren. When the Antichrist uh, is revealed, the wicked one, he's going to speak blasphemies against God. But those blasphemies are, is, 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 is a mouth that's given to him by the power of the devil, the dragon. Before that, he dies, he comes back to, the, come back to life, people wonder who can make war, they're amazed at this Antichrist, they worship him, they take his mark, they worship the dragon, and he continues for a space of 42 months. That's the second half of the seven-year period. So who's taken out of the way? Regular Joe Antichrist man dies, comes back fully under the power and the influence of the devil. Now, I don't know if he's got the same senses as before or he's just like a puppet being used by the devil. I don't really know. But there's something different that takes place. This is why that midst of the week is so important, which the author says, oh, don't worry, it's all the same. No, it's important. Okay, it's such an important um, understanding of that final seven-year period and many things revolve around that period of time and it changes the events. And that's when he seeks blasphemies against God. That's when he goes against the, the believers, against the saints. And so, brethren, I'm going to leave it there. On Wednesday, I'll continue this. I want to cover every argument, every argument. Now, we went through 10 arguments, brethren. Are you convinced of the pre-true rapture? Did I convince you? I, I mean, I read, I read the textbook. Now you're educated. Now I can give you a diploma, all right? You, <laughs> and you, you can pass a test and you can believe in the pre-true rapture. No, it's nonsense. It's nonsense. It's deception. You know, I hate every false way. This does not mean I hate the coming of Christ. Man, I love that. That's going to be so awesome. And I love my brethren. But I hate the fact that they're deceived. And listen, there are many good pastors, many great pastors that believe in the preacher of rapture. I don't hate them either. I understand. I fully understand what they have to lose if they change positions. I had to lose certain things when I changed my position from a preacher to a post-trib believer. Okay, and listen, I wasn't even that, you know, grounded or invested in a ministry, you know, where I, I, at least when I started the ministry, I start fresh. I start with the right doctrine on the end times. But these people have friendships. These people have, you know, groups that if they step out of line on this position, they will be rejected. Are you really going to break fellowship and reject your brothers over a doctrine where you have no verse? Now, you want me to believe in a literal verse that you apparently have that's not never presented, never given, just arguments. Would you break fellowship of a brethren over that, over something that's not even clearly taught in the Bible? Listen, I will break fellowship over someone that denies the return of Christ. That's clear. That's, that's crystal clear. Okay? But a pre-tree believer breaking, brethren, breaking fellowship of brethren that cannot see, the, trying to believe you about the literal reading and, and you're not providing it, that's ridiculous, you know? And I, I can't wait to see this doctrine die, the preacher rapture doctrine. I can't wait for people to finally wake up, believers across this world, and say, we could go for the tribulation. I need to get prepared. I need to get busy for the Lord. I need to get close to the Lord because I might go through those difficulties. And it's like, well, if I'm going to go through those difficulties, who cares about this world? Let's go and serve the Lord. And I reckon if, if our churches would just change and stick to the Bible, all right? And understand that we, we, we can, we're going to face persecution. I have no doubt they're going to be doing greater things for God than they're doing right now. They're going to have a greater heart for the, for the lost than they do today. They're going to have a greater heart even for the Jews. Okay, because they must be saved the same way, believing on Jesus Christ as the rest of us. And so, you know what? I'm happy that I've got pastor friends that believe like I do. Super happy about that, right? And we need to start seeing change. And I know, and if someone's listening to this, a pastor, and you, and you know, there are many pastors, I know, I know this, there are pastors in Australia that their church constitution or their statement of faith says pre-trib rapture. 
but they believe in a post-truth free wrath. And so stop being afraid. Just stand up for the truth of God's word. Prepare your church. Prepare the people that God has put you over to shepherd. Prepare them for the end times. Okay, let's pray.